Now that I've figured out how to work this microphone, <laughs> I'm very pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, Darren Chan, who is going to talk to us about information architecture, which uh, is actually a hugely important topic that we don't talk enough about. So take it away, Darren. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk today. Um, I thought I'd just uh, share about, um, a bit about information architecture. <coughs> a bit about me, uh, I work as an information architect at Rackspace, uh, working in the, in the information development team. Um, and we consist of about, I think around about 16 writers, um, located in Austin, San Antonio, uh, London and Brisbane and Melbourne. Um, I, work from, I work remotely at home in Melbourne, mainly on uh, technical documentation for uh, Rackspace, uh, private cloud, and also for OpenStack, uh, which is an open source uh, cloud operating system. Um, previously, I've worked for about five years as a technical writer in various contracting roles in different industries, um, such as financial services, uh, tech, uh, mining, and um, rail and construction. <coughs> so I guess the reason I'm sort of talking, a, a giving a talk about information architecture is that my role as an information architect is a fairly new role that I've been in for probably about the past uh, 12 months. Um, and it's something that my, manage, my fearless manager, Lana, actually created um, for those who wanted to fo follow more of a technical leadership pathway than, than, than a management pathway. So I guess through the past uh, 12 months or so, it's been a bit of a learning journey for myself to understand a bit more in depth about what information architecture is and how I can actually apply it in what I do. So my talk today is really just sharing some of the things I've learnt and experienced. Um, so the outline of my talk is really just giving, I guess in 20 minutes what I can, talk about what information architecture is, you know, why it's important, some, I guess some considerations you should have when um, practicing good information architecture design um, and some of the, I guess, uh, elements in the design process. And then um, I'll provide some more resources if you sort of want to delve deeper uh, into the topic. So first up, what is uh, information architecture? It, it's the structural design of informational objects so that users can actually find this information quickly. Um, it's the way that information is actually grouped, um, the navigation methods and the terminology used within the system. Um, so what this results in is um, creation of a structure for your content, whether it be documentation, website, um, you know, an, an app, um, that sort of thing. And I guess information architecture as a discipline is probably talked a lot about in the UX sort of field and com commonly sort of references towards designing sort of websites and apps. But in fact, um, information architecture is actually applied anywhere where information is actually um, categorised or arranged. And so I, I guess these are sort of some common examples um, where information architecture is in play. Um, so if you go to a supermarket, um, there's a whole bunch of different sort of classification schemes that's, that's sort of happening so that it's all categorised in a way so to help someone in a supermarket hopefully help find a product quickly, although that's a little bit uh, intermingled with um, some paid product placement. <laughs> um, also there's you know, a digital photo library as well that, that has a whole range of different classification schemes to organise your digital content. <coughs> so why is uh, information architecture important? Uh, there's so much information out there and we have so many ways of interacting with it. And information architecture, architecture actually addresses the problem of making information findable and understandable. Um, it also sort of defines the structures that can be implemented depending on how your information is delivered. So, for example, um, view, uh, viewing a website on a desktop or laptop um, should, func should ideally function differently to viewing it on a mobile device. And also, ide ideally, though, a user's experience using on either um, should be, in terms of being able to find information, should be fairly similar. Another point I want to make is that information is subjective, it's not objective. So, you know, a user will interpret informational objects from the arrangements of things they encounter or experience. 
So a classic example would be like uh, a whether you would classify a tomato as a vegetable, fruit or a berry. Um, for, I guess, your average person, they might, average consumer, they might classify it as a vegetable because their experience is that they've seen it um, in a supermarket amongst all the other vegetables. Um, however, a scientific definition would be that it's considered a fruit um, because it has the seed and the pulp produced from a single ovary. Um, looking at it from a botanical sort of point of view, it would be classed as a berry because of a similar sort of definition. So I guess the, the point is that we actually organise and classify um, things based on how users interpret information and actually look for information. So when you're practising good um, IA design, there's three main factors that you should always consider. Um, and this is probably covered more in detail in a book that's called Information Architecture for the Web and Beyond, uh, which I actually highly recommend um, getting if you want to sort of learn more about it. Um, so the first point is context, so this is like taking into consideration business or organisational elements such as your business goals, your process, your budget, culture, that sort of thing. I mean, and then obviously it's your content, which is, you know, your structure, your data types, um, metadata, all that sort of stuff that people sort of use um, in your system. And then finally, your users. And so these it's important to understand that users have particular information needs um, and particular behaviours in which they, they, they seek for information. So I guess one example would be like for cloud operators, most of the, their behaviour tends to be that they will try and look for information when they're in the heat of the moment, when they're encountering an issue or problem, um, and they always want to try and find that sort of inf information quickly and not have to delve um, deep um, well, yeah, they need to find information quite easily. <coughs> so I guess there's some elements in the IA design process um, that you can consider. So it's user research, content analysis, IA design and IA testing. Um, so looking at re user research, I know it sort of seems obvious, but it's really important to uh, research and understand who the user is. Um, and I'm sort of speaking to myself here as well, rather than making assumptions, it's very easy to try and make assumptions and, and think that you know who the user is. But I've found that doing research, you always find something that you don't know. Um, how much research you do obviously depends on your time and resources that you actually have. Um, if you don't have much uh, of much time or resources, there's a couple of places you can look for existing sources of information. So you can look through search logs, um, web website analytics, like looking at um, page views, bounce rates, that sort of thing. Um, you know, if you can, looking through customer support tickets to see what sort of questions that, that um, uh, or issues that customers are sort of having, or even looking through just customer feedback if you've got mechanisms for, provide for, for customers to actually comment and provide feedback on your content. Um, there's also some techniques that you can use for re user research. Uh, I think uh, most of these are sort of self-explanatory, um, but I think it's important to highlight that, um, that you should try and pick the technique based on what you actually want to achieve. Um, so for an interview, um, uh, the benefit of doing an interview is that you can actually get really in-depth information about your user because it gives you the opportunity to actually um, go in depth on a particular subject or go on a particular tangent um, and that sort of thing. Um, observation method is actually just observing what people do and that's a really powerful way to see how people actually do their job or do, do a particular task or function. function. Um, and this can also be a great way to also validate um, what's been said in an interview because sometimes in interviews um, what people say can be different to what they actually do. And then the last, the last technique is, is, is conducting surveys. Um, uh, I guess a trick with this is, is not creating questions that are yes and no, but sort of creating uh, questions that are fairly open. And that way you sort of capture the language, the concepts, um, and any sort of terminology that they use as well. Um, but I guess a little thing with that is that 
uh, were generally sort of bombarded with su surveys, so naturally people will sort of tend to shy away from actually doing surveys. So a good little trick is really just offering some sort of incentive um, to complete the survey. <coughs> so looking at content and analysis, you know, it's really important to assess um, your content on a regular basis to ensure it's up to date and obviously still relevant to your users. Um, how often you do this, you might want to do this periodically um, or you might do this when there's um, um, significant product changes or there's changes in business goals and that sort of thing. Um, so basically content inventory is just really taking stock of everything that you got, um, uh, all your existing content, so it's all your pages, your images, your data, all that sort of thing. Um, and then that leads into content, uh, content audit, which is basically you, you're sort of setting criteria to actually set, uh, setting criteria to assess your uh, content. So for example, you might want to do it from an editorial point of view, um, where you're sort of assessing it against um, a style guide, or you might want to assess it against it, its appropriateness for, for the audience and that sort of thing. And here's just one example, just done on, a, um, on an Excel spreadsheet that's sort of split into two halves because it actually goes all the way across. So in this example, they've just done a content inventory of, of all the pages, the location of, of where everything is and a short description of what each um, page is. Um, and then they've sort of got an action item in terms of what they're actually going to do with that content and their strategy behind that. And then uh, I guess on the far right hand side, you sort of, they've sort of got some site, site, site statistics so you can, I guess, put some um, criteria for um, assessing your content as well. So the next part is uh, just designing the actual IA. So I, these are sort of the general steps. So it's really just collating um, all your user research data, understanding what your business goals and any existing content. And then you really just, you really just uh, sort of give it a go and just sort of start drafting your topics and high level groupings um, and, and, or chapters or that sort of thing. Um, and then, I guess, reviewing it and checking that it actually addresses the user's sort of needs and then refining that. And then when you sort of get to a point where you, you feel it's sort of, sort of right, then you can get users and stakeholders to actually review um, your content and that sort of thing. And that can sort of go and, I guess, st steps three and four can sort of um, cycle around um, a couple of times. So I guess one, one sort of thing, well, I guess, well, the next slide is really just an example that's something that I'm currently working on with some colleagues um, and with the OpenStack Ansible community. It's fairly raw, um, and this is really just done in a Google document um, just because it was just an easy way for the community to really have input and collaborate um, so you can actually see who's actually added um, changes into the content structure. Um, you can have discussions in a Google document and that sort of thing. Um, so when we initially sort of drafted this operations guide, um, we sort of had our high level groupings or structure by uh, the different sort of service components in OpenStack. Um, and then within that we had, I guess, sort of the operational tasks for, for that particular component. Um, but when we initially showed it to operators, um, they kind of thought, well, that's all right, but it, it didn't really quite sit right with them. And so we probably discussed a bit more and saw some of their documentation, their inter internal documentation. And then we actually flipped the structure around so that their sort of main operational proce processes were, were um, at the top. Uh, it was the high level grouping or chapter. So, you know, I guess you're sort of, you're, you're maintaining your, your cloud environment. Um, sort of your maintenance tasks, troubleshooting, advanced configuration, and then the next level down was, was breaking it down into the different sort of components with OpenStack. And um, when we showed that to them, they said, yeah, well, that's, that's fantastic. They got excited by that, and they said, well, yeah, this makes it easy for us to actually find um, information. So this is something that's uh, sort of in a raw state and the sort of work in progress. But I guess the general sort of framework is something that operators um, were happy with. <coughs> so 
So when you get your, I guess, when you get your content structure to a point where you, you're fairly happy with it, um, there's various ways you can actually test it. Um, and I guess this is known as uh, usability testing and sort of kind of done in a UX uh, sort of uh, field. Um, and so there's two methods you can do that. One is actually card sorting, where you actually sort of create topics on cards and then um, getting your users to add it, actually categorise. And um, just on the slide is one example. Um, this is, uh, I think, the top right and the, and the left is uh, an app called XSort App, which is actually a free card sorting tool um, for RSX. And I believe there's another one as well, which I'll put at the end of the, um, end of the presentation for an open source one um, for all um, distros and that sort of thing. Um, and so there's also another technique which is called um, tree testing, which you can see on the bottom, bottom right. And that's really creating a bunch of questions or scenarios for users um, to answer. Um, so they're presented with a question to find that information and then they just navigate um, in your content structure as, and pinpoint where they actually would find the answer to that information. And so these two techniques are a really great way to understand um, whether you've actually placed information in the right place um, and also gives you some good insights about your users. Uh, <coughs> next, I thought I'd probably show a couple of uh, examples, good examples of, uh, of some content that I think is, uh, has a combination of good design and usability. Um, so the first is actually the, the Redis, uh, on the Redis website, which is um, a data structure server. That's as much as I know. Uh, but if you look in the commands page, um, the way it's designed. So uh, all the commands are sort of listed al alphabetically uh, from left to right, top to bottom. Um, and then each command is in a card with a short description of what that command actually does. Um, so that, that sort of creates an easy way for people to actually find what they want. If they're fairly familiar with the commands, um, they can quickly find uh, the command they want. And then when they click on that, it actually goes into more details about that command. And then alternatively, if someone really knows um, um, their commands, there's also a search, function, a search field to actually search for the specific command. And then alternatively too, um, if they're not that familiar with commands, but they know they want to perform a particular task or function, you can also filter those commands. So the way that this, I guess, page has been designed is obviously to cater um, users from a whole range of, um, who has a, a whole range of knowledge in terms of the commands. The second example um, is one that uh, tech writers often um, mention, it's the Valve Handbook for New Employees. Um, I guess most of you know who Valve are, they do sort of um, gaming engines and a and gaming platforms. And so this is their handbook for new employees. And um, it's just the way that it's structured is a combination of, I guess at a high level, it's subject and topic, and then a mix of being chronological, and then questions that employees will ask or think about. Um, I highly recommend it, highly recommend um, um, uh, reading it. It's a really great read and gives you really insight into what a um, new employee handbook is. Um, and even just the language too is, um, there's no technical jargon or terminology, and it's just all about um, putting um, the employee at ease when they first start at the company. So uh, I guess these are some resources that I sort of recommend that I found really helpful to understand more about information architecture. Um, the first one is Information Architecture through the Web and Beyond, which I mentioned earlier. Um, that's a fantastic uh, book that I recommend. It's just a great reference book um, to understand it in depth, really in depth. And then Donna Spencer, who's actually a, an Australian IA, um, she's written a book as well. So if you know nothing about it, that's a good way to sort of get your feet wet. Um, Paula Land has also written a really good book on content audits and inventories. So also if you've never done, if you've never done a content audit or inventory, um, she basically steers you through the process from writing a business case to actually conducting it 
um, and she provides templates and all that sort of thing. So it's a really, really good book. Highly recommend it. Um, training as well. Um, UX Australia run a conference every year and two days before um, their ma main conference they run a series of workshops and um, pretty much every year they run an IA workshop and Donna Spencer, Donna Spencer actually runs that um, and I went to it last year and it was fast, fantastic, it was really informative. Um, and then the last thing is just a couple of free card sorting tools that um, you can check out as well. Cool. Um, any questions? <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, we're pretty much at time there. Um, does anyone have any, uh, a one real quick question? Anyone have a one real quick question? Yes. Just when you're talking about information architecture and you had the card sorting. Yep. When you have a bunch of documentation that applies in different areas of a product, is there some sort of mapping tool? So if you select the topic or the, the technology, it highlights on that visual map where it applies on the product, or you click on a part of the map, it then shows you, here are the documents that all relate to that type of thing that you've clicked on. Yep. Um, I haven't extensively used it, but from what I've played, I've played with, I think, the XSort app, it can provide a whole range of um, reporting mechanisms. So it shows you, you know, everything from like your demographics of your users um, to exactly the general pattern in which they actually sort of find information and provides you a, a sort of structure of, well, I, just, I guess the consensus on what the structure should be based on, on users' response, uh, responses. But I don't think it can do a whole suite of docs. I think it's per sort of like deliverable. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Darren. Cool. Appreciate it. <laughs>